great privilege to say good morning, Beach Grove Baptist Church, and guests. We're beyond delighted to be here this morning. Good morning, Jane. Um, it's so blinding up here, I'm, I'm not sure who I'm talking to this morning, but it is great to see you. I'm Chad, I'm associate pastor, in standing here because Matt, our senior pastor, is preaching at another church today. That got quiet. Um, he's not preaching in view of a call, uh, so that's good. He is preaching at his home church. Does anybody remember where it is? West Maribel. So they are blessed with uh, Matt and I assume Chelsea and Matt, Madeline this morning. I'm not sure, but they're gone today. Uh, and I appreciate him doing that, going back home. I know that they're excited to have him today. I already told him that's a one-time thing. We're not doing this again next year, so I'm just kidding. He does what he wants to do. In his place today, uh, Kenny and Beth are here. And Kenny, of course, mo many of you all know, is our former pastor, has come today to share the word. And I'm excited to have him. And I know that you all are too. So that's good. All right. We love you all. Thank you for being here today. Y'all, your, your bulletin is super important today. Uh, also, when you sat down, there was a card in your seat. That card is for you to give out to one person this week. Can, can you do that? I've been asking myself that same question. Can I do that? That is an, an invite for next Sunday service, which is a special service, uh, kind of a gospel evangelism service. So I want you to grab that card. I want you to hold it up. I'm not too much into dramatics. Absolutely no one is holding your card up. Thank you, Linda. Here's what I want you to do. Lord, put on my heart whom I'm supposed to hand this card to this week. Give that unto the Lord. I dare say the Lord will show up and give that person into your mind. Uh, keep that card with you. If you don't have your card, invite one person to church next Sunday. That's what this is about. And I appreciate uh, Matt and that that is, that is coming from his heart. And I think that's awesome. So that's the most important thing I want to say in my announcements. Second most important thing today at 4 o'clock. We are going knocking on some doors. I always am afraid a little bit. But when I'm done with it, I say, to, I say this, and I'm not lying to you. Why don't we do this more often? Because it's fun, we want, we want to connect with somebody out there that needs Jesus, that needs a church home, and needs prayer. That's why we're going today at 4 o'clock. We'll meet right out here in the front. If you can't go, pray. That's what I would ask you to do. Just pray and ask God's blessing upon that. But we're going to go out for one hour. We've got some neighborhoods. We're going to knock on doors, and we're going to say to people, how can we pray for you? We're Beach Grove Baptist Church, and we love you. And hopefully maybe somebody out there needs the gospel, and we can, we can do that. So we're going to do that today at 4 o'clock. All right, the rest of that stuff in your bulletin is super important. Kickoff uh, for our, our, our women's work day this coming Saturday. Uh, also, the, the picnic next Sunday. I'd love to have you put that in your mind and keep that in your mind. All right, thank you all for listening so patiently. Let's have a word of prayer. Please consider yourself loved and welcome this morning. I'm looking forward to our worship time, looking forward to our preaching time. Father, thank you for today. And Father, we just want to say thank you for the blessings of this week. Father, you've, give, you've given us rain. You've given us sun. Father, you've given us a great summer. And Father, as we transition a little bit to fall, we know that you have things planned for your church around the world. And Father, we are a part of that, and we thank you for that honor of getting to be your church right here in this little spot in Louisville, Tennessee. Father, we do want the gospel to, to change the world through this church. Father, whatever that looks like, today at 4, this preaching this morning, perhaps somebody here needs to be saved, Lord. Somebody needs to be challenged and strengthened. We give you this service. We're thankful that we're here. We pray for Matt as he preaches this morning. We pray for... West Maryville Baptist Church, Lord, that you would grow them and just encourage them with whatever happens over there today. And Father, we pray the same for us. We need your encouragement. There are people here in this service today, Lord, that just are maybe at their wits' end, that they don't know what to do. And Father, I pray that between the music and the praying 
and the preaching, God, you would affirm their faith and grow their faith this morning. And Father, walk out of here confident in you. That's what we want to do. Our faith is in you, Lord, that you be here with us, you teach us, you correct us, and Father, you grow us. We pray that you would do that in the might and the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that inhabits us this morning, God. We are here for you. Father, we need you desperately every second of this service and every second of our day, Lord. We submit to your leadership and your power and your authority and your loveliness, Lord, your beauty and who you are. We welcome that into our service today, Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Chad. Let's stand together as we begin our time of worship through song and reading and prayer. I'm going to read Psalm 138. Um, just talking about giving thanks to the Lord, how good he is, how faithful he is. We're going to sing his faithfulness today. Um, so let's, let's hear these words of the Lord. It says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands.
I'm going to read from Galatians chapter 2, 17 through 21. I will be singing a newer song after this one, and this is what this song is based upon here in Galatians. It says, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For though the law, through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. 
pray. God, we thank you for what you did for us, for taking our sin, Lord, fulfilling the law, Lord, becoming the new covenant through dying and raising again. Lord, thank you that we can truly say it's, it's, it's no longer us that lives, but it's you that live in us. Yeah. Help us to die to ourselves daily. Take up your cross and follow you. God, lead us um, as we go into this time of offering. Um, thank you for your provision for us, Lord. As we read last week, uh, and as Matt shared, Lord, just how you make us to, to sit down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. You are our good shepherd. And so this time of offering is just an expression of that gratefulness, of that trust in you, Lord. Uh, let it be another just small part of, of our worship this morning. So Lord, we give it to you when we know you already own it all. So Lord, thank you for giving to us. Pray this in your name, amen. Ushers, you can go ahead. continue to sing.
so much that we can say that in confidence. Lord, that you will bring us home. Our future is sure. Our sin is defeated. Thank you so much for those words. And thank you that they're true. So be with us now as we hear your word, Lord. Please give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. That's probably operator error. I apologize, Patrick. Um, but it is good to be with you today. I, if we have not met, I used to be the pastor here. Uh, used to be. There are a lot of used to be's in the room today, I guess, for, for most of us, right? I see a lot of new faces out here, and I see a lot of, uh, I'm not supposed to say it like that, right? It is, it is good to be with you today. And, you know, isn't it, isn't it funny how we identify ourselves a lot of times by uh, by the used to be's in our lives, and when we do, it can feel pretty. Uh, it, it can it, it can feel a little vacuous. It can feel like uh, we've lost something really, really important to us, and uh, because we identify ourselves so much by what we do, and when we don't do it anymore, then we feel like something has, uh, we, we can feel like anyway, something's kind of been wrenched away from us, something that uh, was really, really important to us is taken away. And, um, you know, when things change as quickly as they are in the world we live in today, uh, there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of fear, a lot of, uh, a lot of frustration by the things that, that, that used to be that aren't anymore. Yeah, and, and, and because we, in a lot of ways, identify ourselves by those things, and, we, uh, and, and when they're not there anymore, we either get angry or we get frightened. And uh, we see this a lot, not just in, in the secular world, but in Christian circles as well, right? Uh, we, we, get, we, we kind of lose our equilibrium, and we lose our sense of identity, and that's what I want to talk about this morning is, the, is just the, the idea of identity. Um, you know, after I retired, I've been retired now about two and a half years, and um, it, it has been, I have to say, it has there, in some ways it's been harder than I thought it would be, in some ways it's been great. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it's a matter of kind of redefining yourself. And some of you have gone through that. Some of you have gone through that maybe from a loss of a job or from uh, some other real heavy change that's taken place in your life. And you have to redefine yourself. You have to think about, okay, this is who I was, but now who am I? 
and that has to that ha, that has a lot to do with how you spend your time. It has a lot to do with uh, you know who you spend time with, and all of those kinds of things. And that certainly has changed. anybody anybody experience that? Yeah, and, and, and again, it can be a really good thing or a really hard thing, or it probably, for most of us, can be a little bit of both. I, you know, J.I. Packer, uh, when he retired, wrote a, a little book. It, it's, in, it's entitled, Finishing Our Course with Joy. And he said one of the problems that we have with retirement in the, uh, in the culture in which we live is we suddenly become the masters of our own lives and of our own agendas. And that sounds really good unless it's not, <laughs> right? I mean, you can, you can all of a sudden have so much time and so much, uh, and, and, and you can lose your equilibrium, you can lose your sense of who you are, and this is not just for older people. This is for young people, too. I mean, what we're seeing in the world in which we live today, we're, we're seeing uh, for young people, suicides just have skyrocketed. The, the statistics in suicides have skyrocketed. The statistics in depression and loss of meaning, loss of a sense of meaning, it's just, it's skyrocketed. And, we, and, and behind every one of those statistics is a story, Right? And behind every one of those statistics is a person and a family. And, I mean, there's, there's a lot of pain that comes from, uh, and I think a lot of it is that we told young people, you are the masters of your own lives, you're master of your own agenda. We, we told them all these years, you, uh, you, know, you be whoever you want to be. And whatever you want to be, you can be it, Right? If you can, you know, I mean, every Disney movie seems to kind of center around that, that whole idea. If you can, you know, if you can see it, if you can, if you can think it, you can be it. And, you know, I, I often think about, when I think about identity in, in the Bible, I think about the, the character of Gideon, you know, and Gideon in, in the book of Judges. And, and, and how Gideon, the, uh, how the Lord came to, to Gideon through an angel. And Gideon had lost all of his sense of identity. And, and there he was trying to find himself, and, 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 and an angel comes to him. And what if that angel had said, Gideon, you can be whoever you want to be? I think Gideon might have said something like, might should have said something like, you're the wrong kind of angel. Right? Yeah, but because Gideon couldn't be whoever he wanted to be. He could be who God intended for him to be. And, and, and the Lord spoke through the angel and said, and called him by name, a new name basically, Mighty Warrior. God needed a warrior. And God came to Gideon, and God made Gideon into who, the person who he, he chose for him to be. But it's confusing when all around us we're told that the highest good is for you to be autonomous, for you to be who you want to be, and to, to spend your time and spend your energies exactly how you want to spend it. And if there's no rudder on that ship, it's probably going to run aground. And that's happening to a, a, a lot of folks around us today. Now, uh, when, we, when we think about identity... A lot of times it's something that forms in our lives and we don't even realize it's forming. It forms from what people think of us and, and what we perceive people think of us and it forms from what we think of ourselves and how our own thoughts form within us. Uh, and, you know, they're even saying now, uh, psychologists are putting a lot of emphasis on attachment. And have you heard of an attachment disorder? No, nobody heard of that? Yeah, it's a, it, it, and, and, and a lot of attachment disorder, they say, even is, it comes to our lives, not just from what we experience later on in our lives, but even from the womb. The way we sense that we are perceived and welcomed into the world really matters. And that shouldn't surprise us, right? It shouldn't surprise us. And, and, and we, we gain a lot of our identity from that because all of us want to feel important. I remember when I was growing up, we had a family friend who would come to our house every now and then, and he, uh, he was a guy that just really needed to know 
that he was seen as being important. And he got a job, he got a, a good job as a security guard. Well, when he got, after he got that, when he, when he got that job, he got a uniform and he got a, he got a badge and he got a hat and all those things. And when he would come over to our house, he wasn't going to work or anything. He'd come over to our house. Guess what he did? He wore his uniform and the badge and the hat. And I asked my dad one day, I said, why does he wear that uniform and the badge and the hat? And, you know, why does he? And dad wasn't being derisive when he said this. He said, it's important for him to feel important. And that's true of every one of us. I mean, some of us fake it better than others. Right? I mean, he, he didn't fake it real well with the uniform and all, but, but, but some of us fake it better than others, but for every one of us, it's important to feel important. And the whole idea of identity is complex, but what we're going to see today, God helps us to understand our identity in a different way from what the world around us Help, uh, helps us to see it from how the, the world around us helps us to see it. And, 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 and the God who created us wants us to find our identity in him. And he is unchanging. He is reliable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you find your identity in him, you will never ultimately be let down because he helps us to see, and he's proven time and time again, that he is trustworthy. And when you build your life on him, and if you, when you build your identity on who he says you are, then you can be absolutely certain that, that he is trustworthy. Now, this, so nothing can heal the wounds of our hearts like he can. Nothing can heal the longing of our souls like he can. Nothing can help us to come to grips with the understanding of who we are and who we are created to be like he can. And in just a few moments, we're going to be spending some time in Colossians chapter 3. There are so, so many passages of Scripture we could focus on when we talk about identity, but Colossians chapter 3. But right now, I want us just to kind of walk through so, so the, the Bible, and, and I want us to see how prominent this whole idea of identity is. And I encourage you, as you read your daily Bible readings, I know Matt has really uh, encouraged you to read your Bible daily, right? I, I, am I understanding that right? And... And I encourage you, as you read your Bible daily, think through what is this saying about identity. Because you'll be absolutely amazed at how central this theme of identity, who you are, based on who he is, and how often he says to his people, I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. And, and we, we can begin in the book of Genesis, right? We begin in the book of Genesis. And, and, and we read that God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the, the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God said we're going to make them and we're going to invite them into this creation process, basically. I mean, we become co-creators with God, essentially. We don't become gods, we, but, we, but we have, what, the image of God. And we could talk for several sermons about what that means. But, the, but, but suffice it to say that we are created different. We are different from every other part of creation, and, and, and we are created in the image of God. And so it says that God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then three beautiful words, God bless them. God bless them. And, and, two, and then, two, then three more beautiful words and said to them, God not only blessed them, but he spoke. He spoke to them. He talked to them. Aren't you glad God talks to us? He didn't just create us and cast us to the wind and say, go do the best you can. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number 
fill the earth and, and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God saw all that he had made, and it was, it was, it was very good. It was very good. I don't think it's insignificant. I, I know you've been in Sunday school most of your life. You've heard this before, right? I don't think it's insignificant that God didn't just say here after he created humankind. It's good. He said it's very good. And, and God created us to find who we are, to understand who we are in him. And the next pe- chapters of the Bible give us a picture of how we as humankind are just bent on self-destruction. Despite the fact that God blessed us and, and, and all the ways that he blessed us, we see in the next chapters how we as humankind are just bent on self-destruction, how we go off the rails in time and time and time again and yet God's plan to bless humankind was not thwarted and he came to a man by the name of Abraham and he said Abraham and he called him out of uh, um, among uh, the the peoples the the, the nations and he he said Abraham I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing and, and, and so it wasn't just Abraham and his tribe that were going to be blessed. It was all the tribes of all the people groups, all the nations, all are going to be blessed. But God came to this one, Abram, whom he renamed Abraham, and he blessed him, and he blessed those who came after him, his descendants, and he was constantly saying to them, I am your God, and you are my people. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours, and you are mine. I am yours, and you are mine. And he said to them, there's, there's going to be something different about you. And, he, and, and, and even before he gave them what we call the Ten Commandments, what did he say? I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. And now because of this, because of who you are, this is who you're going to be. This is how, you're going, how this is going to be lived out. This is what this is going to look like. You're going to be different from all the other nations, from all these other people who have gone off the rails All these other people who have uh, have just been bent on self-destruction, you're going to be different from them, and you're not going to be better than them because you do these things. God constantly reminds them you are not a a different, and, and nobody would have looked at you and seen anything extraordinary about you. The only extraordinary thing about you is I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. I am yours and you are mine. But isn't it amazing that those people, too, were bent on self destruction and they went off the rails? And we, and, we, and we read all the way through the Old Covenant, the Old Testament how they, they went off the rails, how they, how they kept losing their way. And, 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 and God came to them over and over in his grace and his love. He came to them through the prophets to remind them, I am yours and you are mine. Don't, you're, you're not to identify yourself like those people. You are to be different. You are to be because you are defined not by the things they are defined by. You're defined by this. I am yours and you are mine. I love that one of the the most graphic and, and yet beautiful pictures of this is in the book of Ezekiel. It's in chapter 16. And and God comes to the people through the prophet Ezekiel. And God says to, to his people, You were castoffs. I mean, you were like cast-offs. I mean, in, in that part of the world in that time, the, the peoples around, the nations, the people groups around the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, the, those people would, if they, if they had a child and they really didn't want the child or the child was not the gender they, were, they desired or there was something undesirable about this child in any way, form, or fashion, or maybe they just didn't want that child, what did they do? They threw it out. 
They literally threw it out. And God said, that's what you were like, Israel, my people. You were like a cast-off child, and I came to you, and I took you in. And I, you were not even cleaned up from the mess of birth. And I cleaned you up, and I clothed you, and I held you close. And then he changes metaphors. And he says, and you, and you were like a bride, or like a, like a woman who was cast off. And in that day, there was no safety net for women. And if they were cast off, they were, I mean, they had no safety net whatsoever. And they likely would starve to death unless they prostituted themselves. And so God said, I, you were like a woman who had been cast off. And I came and I clothed you with beautiful clothing. And I put beautiful jewelry on you and, and shoes on your feet, the best, the, made of the best materials possible and, the, and, and clothing made of the best materials possible. And you were like a queen. You were like a queen, but you prostituted yourself. And you went back into the identities of the people around you. And you, and, you found your, and you tried to find yourself in places where you were never intended to find yourself. And, 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 and in doing so, you have, you, you have run off the rails. You have destroyed yourselves. And God tells them, even the greatest blessings that I would give you, even your little children that I would, that I would give you, you have cast them off. You've cast them aside. As if, as if they, they matter not at all. Isn't that amazing? What a picture that God is giving to us here. You are mine and I am yours. In the book of Hosea, he, he echoes this same thing. He, he tells them, you, you became mine. And, and, in, and in Hosea chapter 11, we, we read, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the gods of the people. They found their identity in other things. And they burned incense to images. They worshipped other things. You know, identities, identities that get misplaced in our lives become objects of worship, right? It is essentially idolatry. And we begin to find our identities in, in other things. And that's exactly, that's exactly what they did. And, and God said to them, it was I who taught you how to walk, taking you by the arms, but you did not realize it was I who healed you. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Isn't that a beautiful picture and yet so sad? Because here these people have forgotten the very most basic, the very most basic thing that God had tried to say to them. And it's something that is so easy for us, for you and me to forget that God says, I am yours and you are mine. And how beautiful this picture of a mother taking a little child up to their cheek. God said, that's how, I, that's how I brought you to myself. And I fed you. I took care of you. And, 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 and so we, we see all the way through the old covenant, the Old Testament, God's people running off the rails, God's people losing their way, God's people identifying themselves after other things other than the Lord. And it sounds like a pretty modern story, right? <laughs> it sounds like a pretty modern problem. But then comes the New Testament, and there was one by the name of John the Baptist who'd been, you know, the prophets had spoken of him, and they said, they came to him, they said, who are you? And he said, I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. I'm, I'm the one who's pointing to the one who is going to come and help you to see in the, in the clearest possible way that 
God, the God Yahweh, the God who created you is yours and you are his. And when he saw him, when John the Baptist saw him, he pointed to him and he said what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he points them to him. And he encourages even his own followers. You go follow him. Why? Because you don't find your identity in me, John said. You find your identity where? In in him. In him. And all the way through the New Testament, the the writers of the New Testament, the apostles, the the ones who were chosen by God to hear through the Holy Spirit and to write down what God said to them, how God spoke to them, they constantly remind us, you are mine and I am yours. You are mine and I am yours. The apostles echo over and over this new identity that's been given to those who come to him. John, John the apostle says it so clearly, for as many as received him, to those who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become, what? Children of God. Children of God. At another point, John writes, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. The great love he has lavished on us. That's an amazing word. You know, I think I remember sharing the illustration one time here. You know, when when I have pancakes or waffles, I don't, I like a little bit of pancake or a little bit of waffle with my syrup. I lavish the syrup on there. And that's what God has done for us. He has lavished his love. Do you see this? Do do you not just see it? Do you feel it down to the depths of who you are? God's saying, I'm yours and you're mine. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. I mean... That, how can you say it more clearly than that? That is what we are. The, and, and, then, and then he says, dear friends, now we are the children of God. He says it again. John has a way of doing that, kind of circling back around. He said, now we are the children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. But we know that when Christ appears... Our eyes are going to be open and we're finally going to see. (laughs) We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Do you see that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's like all of a sudden we're going to say, oh, this is what you mean. I mean, all my life I've kind of danced around it and I've struggled with it, but now I see it. Now I really see it and I feel it to the depths of who I am. And, and, and then John says something that seems a little strange. He, he just kind of says something almost like it's a by, a, a by thought. But, but he says, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now, when we think about pure here, I've often in my mind thought, well, that means, okay, I won't do this, and I won't do that, and I won't do that, and I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do this. You know, it's kind of like, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I've come to realize, I think what he's talking about is purity in the sense of putting away your idols, putting away all the other things that that you have allowed to identify you, and coming to me in purity that I am the one true God and in me you find yourself. You find who I have created you to be. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, for, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. The words in Christ 25 times in the, in the writings of Paul, in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. And 160 times there's the concept of in Christ. 
And, and, and so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. Now listen to what he says. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. And he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. What is he saying? I am yours and you are mine. It's his seal of ownership and, and, and so, so we, we see God constantly saying all the way through his word, this is who you are. Define yourself through this. This is who you are. Not that, not that, not that, not that. But this, this is who you are. Now, very quickly, we're going to just walk through a part of chapter, uh, of chapter 3 of Colossians. Paul writes, since then you have been raised with Christ. All right, your identity is so caught up in him that when Christ was raised, what happened to you? If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus today, when Christ was raised, you were raised, right? Set your hearts on things above. Not all these other things. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. <laughs> That's, I mean, how, how much more identified can you get? Right? I mean, it's like the Lord took you and, and you become one with him. He took you unto himself. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, if, if you lose your life for my sake, you'll what? You'll find it. Do you see the identity? You, you lose your life, but, but you find your life. You, you think you're going to lose something if you yield yourself to the Lord. But no, what you do is you find who you are created to be, who you were meant to be. You find yourself, if you will, not in all these other identities, but in him. When I was a kid, you know, I, we, this time of year, um, it it was hot in our house because we didn't have we didn't have air conditioning. Royce, did y'all have air conditioning when you grew up? No, no, I, I, we didn't have air. You know, at, not until I can't remember how old we were. It was, man, it was amazing. You, you know, you just want to sit in front of that thing because it was one of those window deals, you know. And, but this time of year, it still didn't do the job, right? I mean, especially late in the afternoon, it just couldn't keep up. And so guess what we did when we were kids? We played outside. Amazing. And we were out there after dark. I mean, you know, on these summer nights, we would be out there after dark, and school didn't start until after Labor Day. And, 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 and you know, we, and, and so we were playing, and guess what we played? I can see. What else would you play in the dark, like? You know, yeah, and, 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 you know, we had a, a pretty good-sized yard, but we, it didn't take long until everybody knew all the good hiding places. And it was hard, but, and the key was to find the best hiding place. The best hiding place. And I'm telling you, the key to your life is to find the best hiding place. And the best hiding place is Jesus. Is Jesus. So he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he names all these things, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to, that used to be who you were in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Why? Because those are the, those are the offshoots of having your identity and, and, and the wrong things. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator. Do you see that? Identity. 
Now you are the children of God. And so he says, here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What is he talking about there? He's saying all these ways you've identified yourself, those go by the wayside or those become, those become eclipsed by this one identity. And that is in Christ for you for you are his and he is yours therefore as God's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves with compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience and all the way through here new identity new identity new identity new identity and you lose yourself in him so that you might find yourself and you understand and you realize that he cares for you and it's not mere sentimentality that he cares for you because he points to a cross and an historical event Jesus Christ died for you and he's able to care for you and he points to an empty tomb and says, just as I have been raised, you also will be raised. Just as I have defeated death, death will not defeat you. My victory becomes your victory because you are identified with me. No ever, other effort at finding yourself, no other identity that you take on can do that for you. They will abuse you. They will misuse you. They will make you act in ways that will be self-destructive. They will make every effort to put you square peg into a round hole and make you into somebody you were never created to be. Now, let me just tell you real quickly what difference this makes. What difference this makes. And I could go on and on and on, but let me give you just a few here. Finding your identity in Christ is wonderfully limiting. Now, by that, I refer back to what I said about Gideon. Remember, everybody around us saying, you can what? Be anything you want to be. But you can't. That's a lie. That's a, that's a lie. You, but you can be who you were created to be. And, 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 and that limit, you know, we do, we human beings... When God puts blessings in our hands, he gives us, bless, he gives us boundaries. Why? Because if, if he doesn't, we'll take the very blessings God gives us and we'll do what with them? We'll, we'll take them right off the rails, won't we? I mean, we'll, uh, even the blessings God gives us, we, we, find, we can find a way of tainting them. So God gives us limits, and we do better with limits. Finding your identity in Christ is wonderfully limiting. And finding your identity in Christ is freeing. The crushing weight of trying to define yourself is lifted. You don't have to define yourself. Young, young people, let me, let me tell you, please hear me. Don't, don't buy this idea that you've got to define who you are. That's too much for you. You weren't created. You weren't created for that. You know, in, in the passage of Scripture where, where Paul says, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. I used to think the bought with a price sounded good, but you are not your own, not so good. I mean, let's just be honest about it. I, I kind of want to be my own. So what does God say? No, no, you are not your own, and that's good. You are bought with a price. You don't have to define who you are. The third thing, finding your identity in Christ is restful. Now, by this, let me just say, you know, a, a lot of my life, I'll be honest with you, I've, I've lived like this. I've lived like, okay, Jesus paid for my sins. I was in the negative. Think about negative, zero, and positive, okay? Before I came to Christ, I was in the negative, and he brought me up to zero. He forgave me of my sins. He brought me to, okay. But now, if I'm going to rise up above zero, I've got to do this and do that, and I've got to be this, and I've got to be that. I've got to make my own way. I, I mean, does anybody, can anybody relate to that? I and mean, I, you know, you, we struggle 
to, with, with, with that. And, 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 it, and, and what happens is we, it becomes a, a, just, just a, like being on a treadmill and you feel like you never get to rest. You never get to rest. But let me give you another picture here. I was in debt that I could not pay. I could never pay the debt. And a billionaire came and paid off my debt. That brought me to zero. But he didn't just pay off my debt, but he put me on his accounts. Do you see that? He put me on his accounts. He, he didn't stop there. He, he, and, and what is his is now mine. I mean, that, that is grace upon grace upon grace. And that's what the scripture means when it says we are fellow heirs with Christ. That's what it means when, we, when it says God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that through him we might, through him, not through all the good things you try to do, not through all the, the, the ways you try to, to define yourself, through him we might become the righteousness of God. He has not just paid your debt. He has brought you into his glory. Is another way to say that. The, another thing, finding your identity in Christ leads to big-hearted understanding and long-suffering acceptance of others. Because we're not threatened by the fact that other people around us are going off the rails. In fact, we look with compassion and we say, how can, how can I help them how can I pray for them? How can I love them? How can I be concerned for them and not be threatened by the, the mess that they're making even though their mess bleeds over onto me because I am his and he is mine. And I'm not ever going to be in a deficit no matter what anybody else does and I can receive them with big-hearted understanding and long-suffering acceptance of others. And then the next thing, finding your identity in Christ enhances every other good identity in your life. It, it enhances. Listen, my, my dad became the best dad he could possibly be when he submitted his life to Jesus Christ. He had the identity of being a dad. That didn't go away, but it enhanced. It enhanced that. I mean, mom, woman, man, teacher, I, we, whoever you are today, however, you know, whatever sub-identity you might use to describe yourself today, every one of those that, that is good, guess what he does with it? He takes it and he multiplies it many, many, many times. And then finding your identity in Christ is enduring. Because regardless of your stage in life and regardless of your productivity, you, he is still yours. And you are still his. I've seen through the years um, senior adults and who especially struggle with this because here's what happens when you're when you're young a lot of times you're serving the Lord you're serving the Lord you're serving the Lord you're doing this for God you're doing this for God right I'm doing this for God I'm living my life for God and then you come to a place in your life when you can't do all those things anymore and more than one person I've heard say I just am not even sure I'm a Christian I've, I've heard them literally doubt their salvation. Why? Because all their lives they built their identity on what they did for God. And now all of a sudden they can't do it anymore. And, 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 and I, what I want you to understand is this. I want you to understand that finding your identity in Christ is enduring. It does not begin and end with living for God, but it begins and ends with living with God. With God. Change your prepositions from for God to with God because you are his and he is yours. Now, 
my invitation today is simply this and and Kyle you guys can come on up if, if you want right now all these other identities in our lives have the potential to become idols in our lives they lead us to set our minds on them to the point that even the good things in our lives become not just good but they become ultimate they become objects of worship and idols can't really be removed but they can be replaced with something greater so listen if you tune me out and you hadn't heard anything else I've said hear this repentance in the Christian life and in the, our walk with Jesus is constantly coming in line and coming back in line with our true identity in Christ do you hear what I'm saying as you walk with the Lord day in and day out, daily, I don't know about you, but daily, I have to do this. I, I have to weed the garden. Right? Because things begin to grow there that don't belong there and aren't going to profit me or profit anybody else. And so repentance becomes not just saying, oh, God, I did this bad and I did that bad and, I, you know, I didn't do this like I should have and that like I should have. No, 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 no. That's all performance-based anyway. Perform, uh, repentance becomes weeding out all those idols that get set up in your life and putting them in their proper order and being sure that there is only one that is at the top because you are his and he is yours since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator let's pray Father, thank you so much that you have, in your word, helped us to see this one great, great overarching truth that you are ours and we are yours. And Lord, this world and, the, and our flesh and the devil lead us in so many other ways. And we become like the people of old if we're not careful and we run off the rails and we lose our sense of who we are and we become self-destructive. And oh God, I pray that you will awaken us to, to this. That every other identity is always going to be insufficient and even can become destructive in our lives. But thank you today that we can say together with all of your people down through the ages, he is my God and we are his people. And we pray that you will imprint this on our hearts today. And for that person today that's struggling, Lord, just struggling with Identity, who am I? What's, where do I find meaning? Where do I find direction? Where do I, may I, I pray, Lord, that they would just hear these words, that they would hear you saying, you are my child. And that that person would come to you today afresh and anew and find their hope, their life, their identity in you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing and respond?
As we go, uh, just hear this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's dismiss with the doxology. Thank you.